So this talk is a little bit about wildlife, but it's mainly about orchards and mainly about apples. Um, and their sort of iconography, semiotics placed in our culture because they they share for reasons that we won't go into because that will be a completely different talk um, a massive place um, in our cultural consciousness and, and have done for a long long time so we're going to start with a whip through about two and a half thousand years of popular culture not necessarily in the right order um, it has to be said. Um, now then, it's not letting me change slide. Can you try the... Oh, oh. Yeah, okay, that's it. Okay. So, Martin Luther, bit of an odd bloke, had a lot of ideas. Some of them are a little bit wee, some of them are a little bit were. Um, but this is one of his better ideas. Um, and one wonders why Martin Luther said that, really. Um, it might have had something to do with this. The creation myth. There's um, Eve coyly trying to hide the apple behind her back, having been tempted um, by the serpent. Uh, note how well ripped Adam is in this picture, um, an absolute Adonis of a man. Loads and loads and loads of Christian iconography um, full of apples. This is Lucas Cranach. This is one of the very few Lucas Cranach pictures I was able to find where the lady was not completely undressed. Um, he had a penchant uh, for painting naked ladies. Very beautifully painted, it has to be said. Uh, that penchant for painting naked ladies started in around the Renaissance, and we might come back to that. So lots of Christian iconography. But it goes back... Um, much, much earlier than that. This is the most astonishing Greek um, drinking vessel. It's enormous. You could get about three gallons of cider in that. Um, and I like to think that they actually did get about three gallons of cider in that. And so this is apple harvesting um, in Greece two and a half thousand years ago. Botticelli, bit of a bonkers painting. You can see that the women are becoming slightly undraped here. You'll notice that all these painters were men and all these women were of a certain age um, and comely. This is a totally bonkers painting. It portrays um, a mishmash of Roman and Hellenic mythology uh, with Venus and Flora and the three Graces and Cupid who were never around in the same story. Um, but apples figuring large nonetheless, because this is probably the Garden of Hesperides. Rotundus and Pomona, classic um, Roman mythology, um, and it's all about seduction as most Roman mythology is. Rotundus was the god of orchards. Pomona um, was the goddess of fruit and orchards. Is my pointer working? Someone give me a thumbs up. Yes, excellent. The interesting thing about this painting is that Pomona is carrying what is either a pruning knife or a grafting knife. Well, I think it's interesting anyway. Pre-Raphaelites, this is Pomona again. Um, the pre-Raphaelites were crazily into um, Roman um, and Greek mythology um, and spent most of their time um, painting it. She's lost her pruning knife now, but she's got lots of apples, bless her. Warburn Jones. This is the Garden of Hesperides. Um, 
So this is where Hercules had to go to go and pick the golden apple. So again, we've got this, these apple illusions all the way through mythology. But it's not just in um, post-Christian mythology or Roman or Hellenic mythology. Uh, apples also figure very large um, in Norse and Icelandic uh, mythology as well. So this is Idun. Um, she is the, um, one of the daughters of uh, Odin and Frigg. And we'll come back to Odin and Frigg in a bit. Um, in order to get into Valhalla and to have eternal life, you had to have had an apple from Idun. Um, so again, um, this apple looming large in people's consciousness is something that was really, really important. Um, by the time we got to the 1800s, people had stopped painting apples in mythology, um, but they were still painting apples. Um, so this is one of the uh, plates from the Heritage of Pomona. Um, and when everyone thinks of the Heritage of Pomona, they think of Thomas Andrew Knight, who wrote it, um, second president of the Royal Horticultural Society, a uh, very important man in his day, um, had a very important brother called Richard Payne Knight, um, who um, was one of the great landscape um, architect promoters of the time, but also strangely into phallic imagery, which we won't tread into tonight. Um, of course, when everyone thinks of the Hereford Pomona, they think of Thomas Andrew Knight, rather than the two women who did all the hard work for it, which were Francis Knight, his daughter, and Elizabeth Matthews, who actually painted all the plates in it. Thomas Andrew Knight just wrote a few little bits and pieces to accompany each rather beautiful plate. Um, so, same as it ever was. Cezanne. Cezanne was completely bonkers about apples. Um, I mean, everyone started to paint still life with apples at, you know, at this point in the evolution of art history. But Cezanne just point, painted apple after apple after apple. He was obsessed with them. And on his right, um, in a pencil sketch, self-portrait he's even painted himself with a wretched apple sort of floating in the sky next to his rather apple-like head um, a bit weird really René Magritte everyone knows his famous sissy Nepaz Peep but not so many people know one of the um, other paintings in the series Sessi Nepaz and Pom um, this is also one of his famous paintings on the left and my internet connection is unstable so I hope it stabilizes again. Um, the point about this and the point he was trying to make is that this isn't an apple. This is a representation of an apple. It's obviously not an apple because you can't eat the wretched thing. Um, um, that was a sort of surrealist point that he was trying to make with these paintings. Um, Magritte uh, influenced uh, a huge number of artists that came afterwards and was a serious influence on the pop art movement. I hope all of you recognize this very famous logo, the Apple Records logo. I hope some of you recognize the album, which is the quintessential Beatles white album. Um, and I hope some of you at least have heard it and enjoyed it. Um, and then coming virtually right up to date, everyone knows that. Um, so for two and a half thousand years, we've been using our apples um, semiotically and in iconography and as logos and all the rest of it. Um, I won't go into why, because that would take a whole other talk, um, but interesting nonetheless, they have, been a subliminal part of our consciousness forever and ever and ever. If we move on to mistletoe, that also um, has sort of followed the same route. Um, and of course, mistletoe is intimately connected with apples because its major host plant um, is the apple. 
one wonders what they all did before all the apples came to Western Europe. Um, they do grow, mistletoe does grow on other trees, um, but not on many, and it's predominantly on apples. This is the um, Icelandic saga um, about Balder, who was the son of Odin, um, so this is from uh, non-Christian mythology. Frigg had made Balder um, immortal, or so she thought. Um, she had decreed that he couldn't be killed by anything that came from the ground or grew on the ground. And so um, Loki, who was beloved, sorry, Balder, who was beloved of the gods, um, would play games with people where people would just throw rocks at him and hit him with knives and axes and he'd just go, you know, um, call that an axe, call that a knife, you know, I'm immortal. Until this nasty fellow, whose name I've forgotten, persuades this fellow, Loki, who is blind, and has very odd buttocks, as you can see, quite why his buttocks look like that, I don't know. Um, persuaded um, Loki um, to stab um, Balder with a spear made of mistletoe wood. And because the mistletoe didn't come from the ground and didn't grow in the ground, um, it got round Frigg's um, magic spell um, and that's how Loki died. But this will go back way further in mythology. So this is Aeneas. Ooh, a very extraordinary noise. Probably means it's got a mouse. Um, this is Aeneas looking for the golden bough. <clears throat> for those of you who don't know the story of Aeneas, he's on a search um, for his dead father. He has to get down into Hades, into the underworld. And the only way he can get down into the underworld is to find the golden bow, um, which is a bunch of mistletoe, pluck a sprig of it, and then that will give him access to the underworld. And that's how he did it. Went to see his father, came back up, everyone lived happily ever after. Um, so mistletoe figures large in mythology as well. Particularly among the dear old druids, I love the dear old druids. There's there's not a lot of evidence that there ever were any dear old druids, but we'll go along with, with the story for the sake of the argument. <coughs> Supposed Celtic um, priests and um, priestesses, we'll come onto the priestess in a minute, looking for the mistletoe on the oak tree because of the mistletoe oaks that were sacred. There is actually a mistletoe oak in our village, I have you know. Um, and you have to cut it with the golden sickle. Quite, oh, okay. quite sorry. Quite quite what you do with the mistletoe once you cut it with the golden sickle. Um, history is silent, but we'll get onto that when we get to Asterix and the Gaul, um, where we might get a pointer. So here we are, all these men, as you can see, uh, because they're the only ones who can climb trees, obviously, and the only ones who are allowed to ascend to the, uh, the heights of the priesthood. Um, however, having got the mistletoe down, you need someone to carry it. Um, and of course, you find a lovely, comely looking young woman to carry your mistletoe for you, because that's the only thing that women were good for in those days. What's interesting about this is this is clearly, well, to me anyway, this is clearly a French Druidic priestess. And I can tell that because of that that she's carrying, which is a kuki. And um, wherever you go in Normandy and Brittany, um, hanging up in farmhouses, you will find kuki. And it means the mistletoe cutter. Guy, G U I, is the French for mistletoe. And it's probably actually a Celtic word for mistletoe uh, in derivation. Uh, and she's got a coup guy, um, and she's carrying off the mistletoe to do with 
who knows what, um, but we might come back to why it's important in a moment. Note again, it's about a 20 year old woman. Um, the French um, were very into, um, again, the iconography of mistletoe. Um, and there are a stunning series of um, Art Deco and Art Nouveau um, pieces of glassware by Lalique. Some of you will know Lalique. Um, uh, displaying mistletoe um, and if you've got about 20 grand to spare you can probably buy that uh, and if you've got about 30 grand to spare you could probably buy that as well helen wants me to buy both of them apparently no oh, just the right number one um there's a french postcard um from hand colored from the turn of the century, turn of the last century, not this century, um, cutting mistletoe. It was called New Year mistletoe. Um, and so in France, mistletoe is a, um, a New Year thing rather than a Christmas thing, um, which goes back to its pre-Christian pagan um, traditions. And we come relatively right up to date. This is get a fix. I all read asterisks and the goal. Um, it's got lots of good adult jokes in it as well as children's jokes in it. This is Getafix um, with his golden sickle. Look, because he's a druid, remember Getafix um, with his golden sickle in an oak tree cutting the mistletoe. Mistletoe um, was uh, one of the important ingredients um, in Getafix's potions. Um, uh, and he made these potions in order that you could get a fix, ho, 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 um, hence his name. Um, I probably wouldn't want to um, get off my head on uh, something that had a lot of mistletoe in it because it's quite poisonous, actually. Um, <coughs> and then we go on to Yuletide osculation. Um, the kissing under the mistletoe is probably a Victorian um, invention, although the bringing of mistletoe into the house um, is, is extremely old indeed. And it's the, the whole thing about bringing greenery uh, into the house um, around the turn of the year um, in order to uh, bring good luck. So why this fixation with mistletoe? Uh, why was it treated to such a mystical plant? Well, I think there's several reasons. One is it's parasitic, so apparently, you know, doesn't have any roots. Um, very few people ever saw it germinate. If you plant the seeds in the ground, nothing happens, they rot away. So it appears as if by magic on trees. It's evergreen um, and it's green right through the winter. Um, which is really important, um, particularly in uh, pre-Christian times where you brought this evergreen uh, vegetation into the house. But um, it's also a major um, fertility symbol. Um, it has white berries, which is really, really unusual. More than that, the berries are paired. So you have a pair of white berries um, hanging below these pairs of leaves. And if you squish them, this white stuff comes out of them. Um, so it's not difficult to see um, how it became um, intimately associated with fertility um, and how then the kissing under the mistletoe um, stuff started. Right, that's enough of folklore and mythology and art i think yes it is so where do these wretched things happen come from because um apples leaving aside crab apples which are a completely different species um, our apples in our orchards are not a native um, uk species they're not even a native western european species um, they all came 
from the Tian Shan Mountains in Kazakhstan, and from um, the fruit forests near Almaty. Um, and there are still fragments of these fruit forests left. Um, and they're full of loads and loads of apple trees and other fruit trees as well, but predominantly apple trees, all of many different varieties in inverted commas. Now, as you probably all know, if you plant a Cox's orange pippin seed, when it comes up, you don't get a Cox's orange pippin, okay? So our apple varieties do not come true from seed, almost without exception. If you um, decide you want to um, do a root cutting, um, that doesn't work either. So how on earth are you going to spread these apple trees? We well, have to spread them, as you probably all know, by grafting, which means if you want to move them around, you have to move the graft wood around. It's the only way you can take your nice Cox's orange pippin or whatever from the Tian Shan mountains to Herefordshire, uh, bit by bit, grafting it along the way. And here we are, here's the Tian Shan Mountains here. Um, here's the silk roots going uh, east and coming west. Um, so these apple grafts came west along and uh, through Samarkand along the silk roots to um, eastern Anatolia. And then along the seaways, along the sea routes from then on um, throughout Western Europe. difficult to know when they exactly got to the UK because uh, there's not a lot of written records. It's probable that they got here in the Iron Age because by then all these trade routes were pretty well established so um, it's more than likely that they got here uh, into the UK in the Iron Age. It was certainly here by the Roman occupation. Um, by the time Willy the Conch arrived um, they were pretty much uh, universal throughout the country. You have to remember that the climate was much more benign then as well, so you could grow them uh, in many more parts of the country than uh, you can easily grow them now. So this is a distribution of orchards in the UK, traditional orchards in the UK. So you can see uh, here up in Scotland, virtually none at all. Island Mull, where I was last week, not a single traditional orchard to be seen. How weird is that if you live in Herefordshire? No orchards, bizarre. Look at this, this, that's us, that's us. Down through Somerset into Devon, Kent, quite a lot in East Anglia. But look at this massive concentration of traditional orchards uh, in Herefordshire. We are England's other Garden of Eden. But they're not evenly distributed in Herefordshire, which is a map of Herefordshire. They're clumped, um, not many around the edge, because generally around the edge, um, uh, we've got uplands, um, and they don't grow so well in the uplands. So they're mainly a lowland phenomenon um, in Herefordshire. And they come in various shapes, sizes, and guises. The oldest orchards we've got um, are the farmstead orchards. They predate the cider and perry industry, um, which was a sort of 18th century onwards industry. So our oldest orchards are the farmstead orchards. They were, as their name suggests, associated with farmsteads and settlements. They grew a variety of different apples, pears, plums, etc. Um, so they would be growing um, culinary pear, sorry, culinary apples, uh, dessert apples, cider apples, and within that there would be growing a range of varieties. So within the dessert apples, they'd be growing ones that kept and ones that had to get straight from the tree. And the same with culinary apples. They'd also be, be growing um, peri pears and cider apples. So the farmstead orchards tend to have, or tended at least, because there aren't many of them left now, um, a very wide variety uh, of, of fruit in them. There are a few left. Then late 18th century onwards came the cider and perry industry 
uh, that coincided with actually paying farm workers in cider and perry and they would go on strike if they didn't get it um, so um, uh, the cider and perry industry really took off um, in Herefordshire and so did the orchards um, that was followed by in the 19th century a, a bunch of commercial dessert and culinary orchards particularly with the coming of the railways so the railways came it meant you could um, get your top fruit to market very quickly um, so in Carl Wall where I'm sitting as soon as the railway came um, the big commercial um, orchards uh, started up um, and they were um, st sticking boxes and boxes of all sorts of stuff uh, on the train to go to Bristol and Birmingham and London but that was only possible uh, once the transport links had been established and you could get them quickly to market um, so in Cold War once the railway had come at the peak um, they were sending I think it was uh, 40,000 boxes of apples uh, a week during the height of the picking season and these are big um, let me see big boxes sort of two feet by one foot by one foot boxes huge huge amounts of stuff being sent to market and then finally um, towards the end of the 20th century in came the modern bush orchards which we don't say much about because they're not very good for wildlife generally So I just want to, um, if I can, and I'm going to move you off that set. Um, this is Colwall, um, where we've done a lot of work on orchards, so we know a lot about the orchards in Colwall. So our earliest record of an orchard in Colwall is 1577. That orchard is still there. Um, and that orchard is on the site of a moated Norman manor house. And presumably, although we can't prove it, uh, was um, uh, originally dated from uh, Norman times. It was certainly there in 1577. Now then, place for this set of um, slides. This is a, a, a time sequence um, of coal wall. For those who know coal wall, this is the main road through it. And we keep our eye on that orchard there. So that's the 1840 tithe map. That's the 1986 Northern Survey map. Still there, look. And that's the 2002 um, aerial photo. And you can see it's still there. And in fact, it's still there today. So we've got, in some places, great orchard continuity. Um, whoops, sorry, beg your pardon, hang on. So we will get around to some wildlife in a minute. So what about the state of orchards in Herefordshire today? Well, it has to be said, it's pretty parlous. Most of our orchards now are bush orchards, modern bush orchards, which are, to be honest, pretty pants for wildlife. Um, they're essentially um, grubbed up every 10 years or so and replanted. Uh, they're often sprayed underneath. The grass is mown to within an inch of its life. Uh, they, they're not grazed. Uh, the grass is managed by mowing, throwing lots and lots of carbon into the air. Uh, they're sprayed and blah de blah de blah. You get the idea. Some of them are quite nice. This is an abandoned um, bush orchard. Um, where the trees are beginning to make a bid for freedom. Um, unfortunately, it failed. It's been chopped down now, but never mind. Um, the modern standard cider orchard, some of you will recognise this uh, grinning fool. Um, he won't mind me saying that. Um, it's Bill Wigging, one of our MPs. Uh, and Bill won't mind me saying, uh, because he knows that uh, we don't disagree about, sorry, we don't agree about uh, politics very much at all um, but I have to say that Bill has been a great champion for orchards in Herefordshire um, and he's always a useful port of call um, 
uh, when you need a little bit of political persuasion around the back. Um, he doesn't live in Cornwall anymore, but this was his cider orchard. Uh, he did look after it, although, as you can see, it's a bit overgrazed. Um, he did make cider. It was jolly good cider. I won't tell you how he made cider because environmental health would have been down on him like a ton of bricks, but it was jolly good cider, nevertheless. Typical orchard in Herefordshire now, most of the trees gone. Those trees that are remaining are absolutely festooned with mistletoe because no one manages the mistletoe anymore. We used to manage mistletoe uh, regularly in all our orchards. Uh, Travelling people um, used to manage the mistletoe to make a bit of pen money at Christmas. But then the dastardly French um, passed an ordinance in um, Brittany and Normandy that required you by law to manage your mistletoe, the sensible French. As a consequence of which the French ended up with loads of mistletoe on their hands. Hmm, what shall we do with this mistletoe, I wonder? I know, I have a bonny day. I will sell it to perfidious Albion. And so they flooded our market with French mistletoe at ridiculous rock bottom prices because they had to cut it anyway. And it was either throw it away or sell it at rock bottom prices and make a bit of money for it. Um, that cut the bottom right out of the English mistletoe market. And now the vast majority of mistletoe that you buy at Christmas is actually not. Uh, English mistletoe. It's French mistletoe. Never mind, what did Brexit ever do for us? But some of our traditional orchards are still very lovely. This is a peri pear corner in one of our uh, orchards in Cornwall. Um, it's not just apples. I've been banging on about apples for far too long now. Um, there are other types of orchards. This again is in Colwall. You have to uh, forgive the Colwall emphasis here. It's where most of our pictures came from. This is the largest remaining cherry orchard um, in the West Midlands. Uh, it's in Colwall. This orchard, this is a 19th century orchard. This orchard produced every single glacé cherry that Cadbury's ever used in their chocolates at one point in time. Um, because they could pick them and they could get them on the train to Birmingham um, uh, within a couple of hours. Uh, and so they had a complete market of glacé cherries um, for um, Cadbury's. This is a rather uh, poor remains um, of um, a lovely set of orchards. This is a damson orchard, what's left of it in Whitbourne. And I know there are two folk from Whitbourne here, so hello. Um, so we had lots of damson orchards. You know, the woodpecker who. Um, and this um, is uh, a, a walnut orchard in the corner of an apple orchard uh, in Breeson. A rather poorly managed an apple orchard, but I'll say. Well, we'll say some more about that, but we won't name the guilty party. Okay, they're all getting knocked down. Many of them are being bulldozed. This is an orchard that's just been bulldozed. And then set on fire. Because despite the fact that traditional orchards are a biodiversity action plan habitat, despite the fact that they're supposedly a material planning consideration, uh, in Herefordshire, um, this site um, is now a housing estate in Barter Street. Um, the irony is um, that having knocked all the orchard trees down and built the houses, they then planted birch trees between all the houses. Instead of being sensible and thinking, oh, maybe we can leave some of these nice apple trees and build the houses around them. No, 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 no. Um, there's another one, bulldozed, burnt, again for housing development. This is a nice orchard of Breeton, which until very recently um, 
the western uh, bypass, the western relief road for Herefordshire, was due to go right through those trees there. Um, thankfully, and I hope um, Herefordshire Council stick to it, they're not going to um, build the western uh, relief road now, uh, and maybe those orchard trees will be there for a bit longer. But our, our, our orchards are being assailed on all sides. Uh, some of them are just being abandoned, like this one, uh, or, or left for the trees to fall down, not replanted, um, or the mistletoe not being managed, and so the weight of the mistletoe tops the tree, or this one, which is managed by a conservation organisation, not the Heritage Wildlife Trust, I should say. Um, this is in Herefordshire, managed by Herefordshire. Um, by a nature conservation organisation, allegedly, um, horribly overgrazed. Um, chomp, 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 sheep, sheep will, uh, tree falls over, so overgrazed that the tree, the sheep have to eat the bark off the trees because they've ate all the grass. Come sap, and you can see how overgrazed this orchard is, just massively overgrazed in the winter. No grass left to eat. Okay, we'll eat some trees then, shall we? Or inappropriately managed. It's a horrible bit of inappropriate um, orchard pruning. Because people have forgotten how to prune orchard trees anymore. That's the trouble. We've lost, we've lost that rural skill. Another overgrazed orchard. This is all sheep damage. This has been barked in the winter. This tree is going to die. Uh, if it doesn't die from the sheep damage, it'll probably fall over because oh, well, Helen says it has died. Um, I don't know whether it died from the sheep damage or it fell over because all the lower branches have been taken off the tree so that you can get your tractor in. Um, and as a consequence, it's very top heavy now. Its centre of gravity has been shoved right up here instead of being down here. And so it either falls over or dies of sheep damage. It would be an orchard tree. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a boy with a toy. Um, I've got a chainsaw. Um, I'm going to just chop these things up because I don't like them. When I've failed it, I'm just going to chop it into bits. I'm not actually going to use the bits for firewood, but I've got a chainsaw and I like using it. So I'll just chop this tree into bits because I'm having fun with my chainsaw at the same time throwing CO2 into the atmosphere. Am I ranting? Yes. Yes, I'm told I'm ranting. This is a rather nice orchard in Cornwall. Some of them are very nice. Some of them that we've got left are being relatively well managed. They are still um, in good nick. They, they do, that's, this is our farm. They do have Herbridge Wire Trust Reserve. They do have some youngish trees, some replacements planted that are coming through. Um, and they are just lovely. And that's why we should care. This is, for those who are really into apple varieties, this is Edward the Seventh. Um, and you can tell it with the seventh because it's the middle of valley winter and it's still on the tree. And that's one of the reasons that the sevens were planted because they hold onto their apples forever and ever and ever. And when you fancy an apple, even in February, you can go into the orchard and plant one. A plant one, pick one. Two and a half thousand fruit varieties in the UK, most of them gone now. Um, there's a reason that some fruit varieties are really rare, and that's because they're really crap apples. Um, and that's why they became rare, but many of them are, st are still very good apples, we just don't grow them anymore. It's whizzing through now, but I love the look of apples, they're just gorgeous things. Okay, we are finally got onto wildlife and we're just going to finish up with wildlife. Having gone through all that, having gone through the culture and the history um, and the rant about modern management, uh, when I am going to just finally finish up with um, a bit about the wildlife. I do like a nice picture of poo. Um, and this is a nice picture of poo. Some of them you will recognize this badger poo. Why is there a great big pile of badger poo here? Because they've been destroying this fallen um, apple, no, pear tree. It's just this fallen pear tree. Why are they destroying this fallen pear tree? Because it's absolutely full of great big fat beetle larvae that are living um, uh, inside the tree. Really good places for um, 
reptiles. Really good places for small mammals. This is um, the, the base of a hollow um, plum tree. And these are all the plum stones that had fallen off as plums um, and been taken into the hollow. Uh, in this case, I think by a vole, but dormice come and scamper away with them and all sorts, um, and then fed on through the winter. Um, there's some debate as to what this brown stuff is. Well, we know it's poo. Uh, it's, the question is, what poo is it? Um, and we might come back to that in a second. Great places for birds, um, woodpeckers, green woodpeckers, great spotted woodpeckers. Uh, the last remaining habitat really for lesser spotted woodpeckers in Herefordshire, which has still got a reasonable population. These birds are characterised, and nearly all birds that nest in, in orchards are characterised by the fact that they nest in holes, um, either ones they make themselves or ones that they find. Really great in the winter for birds, um, red wings and field fares on the windfalls, um, black caps and wax wings and mistle thrushes on the mistletoe berries. That's where mistle thrush gets its name. If any hadn't dropped before, that's where the mistle thrush gets its name because it eats mistletoe. Absolutely brilliant for fungi, um, oyster mushroom. Uh, this is an incredibly rare fun fungus, orchard tooth fungus. Uh, um, biodiversity action plant species only grows on veteran apple trees. Um, Helen uh, tells me that this is um, a puffball, but I don't believe her. Um, and the grasslands in orchards um, are incredibly good, um, often for uh, rare grass and fungi like wax caps that we've got here. Fungi are really important in the hollowing process in trees. I won't go into the detail, um, but trees hollow uh, through the actions of initially fungi, which will start to decompose um, the heartwood of the trees. This is what's called white rot, and it's one set of fungi does this. And look at all the little holes. This is where all the creepy crawlies are, have come out. Um, this is so-called red rot fungi, different set of fungi, but they still hollow the tree. And again, look at all the holes. This is where the creepy crawlies have been living. The creepy crawlies can't live uh, in the trees until the fungi has started the rotting process. And once they've done that, uh, then all these creepy crawlies are able to colonize the tree um, and eventually hollow it. Woodpecker hole. Once it's hollow, then the woodpeckers and the blue tits and everything can get in and the pole cats, pole cats and ultimately the pine martins when they get here. Um, huge numbers of um, deadwood eating invertebrates inside these trees. There's some galleries of a bark beetle which lives under the tree, under the tree's bark. Um, more poo, and I think this poo is the same poo that was in the picture with the um, uh, with the plum stones. This is noble chafer poo. We get very, very excited when we find this sort of poo. This is our favourite poo of all time because it uh, comes out of the back end of this wonderful thing, the noble chafer beetle. Um, vanishingly rare thing. Um, this is a larva for about seven years inside the tree. Um, comes out, lives for about 10 days, just enough time to uh, mate, uh, smile and die. Loads of these things. Um, Red-headed cardinal beetle. This is a jewel beetle, a longhorn beetle. This one is just crazy. This is the larva of the cobweb beetle. Um, the larva lives in cobwebs in the middle of hollow trees, particularly apple trees, and it lives on the shed skins of the spiders that live in the cobweb. It has this uh, ability not to get caught in the cobweb, so it can scamper about in the cobweb going, yummy, there's another shed skin of a spider. I leave that um, bonkers creature. Um, mistletoe, okay. One of the problems with mistletoe is no one manages it anymore. Um, so we've got loads of it. 
it's great that we've got loads of it in a way because it supports um, uh, a, a small but vanishingly rare set of creepy crawlies. This is a baby mistletoe plant if you've never seen one before. That, that's the seed and that's it germinating in inverted commas because the seeds don't germinate, they're a bit weird. And mistletoe is the host for the mistletoe tortrix moth, biodiversity action plant species, UK headquarters, Herefordshire. Um, it, its larva lives inside the leaf. So the moth laid an egg there, the larva trundled about inside the leaf, getting bigger and bigger until it popped out here. Here it is after it's popped out, uh, it then trundles around on the outside, chomping on the outside of the leaf, turns into a pupa, and then turns into um, the moth itself. Okay, nearly there. But if orchards aren't important to us as well as wildlife, then we're not going to value them. Um, you know, we all like scrumping. These two have just been caught scrumping. Um, this was not a posed photograph. Um, they are pretending that they're not scrumping, although it's rather difficult to pretend you're not scrumping. Um, this is a bunch of kids in one of, in our cherry orchard in Colwell learning to write haikus. Um, so we've got to engage these kids um, in this sort of stuff. Uh, with Annalisa Emmons Dean, who's a very famous uh, wildlife poet, The Bard with the Buzz. self-explanatory. Uh, that's your very lovely uh, chief executive officer when she used to dye her hair. Um, <laughs> Cheeky. I have to say she's very lovely because she's sitting just behind me. Um, but what I love about this picture is the expression on those kids' faces. Just look at the expressions on those kids' faces. Uh, and all which are just amazing places to be able to engage children with wildlife. Um, and to engage grown-ups. Uh, and if you don't come to the Coal War or sale, you ought to. It's the biggest and best in Herefordshire. 500 people can't be wrong every year. So finally, what can you do about it? Well, you can be an orchard champion. And I know there are some orchard champions watching this. You can just champion orchards. You can drink cider and perry. I'm drinking gin, but you can drink cider and perry. Learn about orchards so you can talk confidently to people about them, so you know a little bit more than they know. Find your local orchards and their owners and engage with them. Make sure that your people who own your local orchards know that you value them. Because if you value them and they know you value them, they're more likely to value them as well. And trust me, we, kn we know that works. Um, join a local group or former local group um, uh, and HWT the trust um, has got some exciting uh, developments uh, in the pipeline at the moment we'll, we should be able to help you uh, to form a local group to look after your local wildlife do berate the planning authorities they hate being berated but that's what they get paid for um, raise money send some of it to the trust if you haven't made a donation for this talk then please make a donation and if you're not a member of the trust, and I'm sure you all are, um, then join the trust. I'll leave you with the same quote that I started with. Thank you very much. That's it. Thank you, Tim. That was really, really interesting. Interesting and amusing. <laughs> um, my favourite fact there was that all our apple trees come from Kazakhstan, which was I never would have thought of. <laughs> Um, do you want to stop sharing your screen and then we'll just see if we have any questions? Lovely. Um, I actually had a question to kick us off. Um, yeah. What, how have, like, why the density of orchards in Herefordshire? Why is no. that? <laughs> That's a really good question and no, and no one really knows the answer, I don't think. Some people will tell you that we've got the ideal climate um, for uh, growing um, orchard trees in Herefordshire. Um, but the climate in Herefordshire is very different from the climate in Kent. 
Um, and they would probably give the same answer. So I don't think that's true. Mm. I think it's um, actually a historical quirk. I think it's partly that the landscape landscape change has hit Herefordshire more slowly than the rest of the country. Um, and so we've lost them at a slower rate. But I think it's also because um, the cider industry took off in Herefordshire. It was founded in Herefordshire, promoted in Herefordshire. Um, and so there was an economic um, reason to have uh, orchards in Herefordshire. Uh, what, what's really annoying is that um, the, the method champenoise, the champagne method, um, which is used to bottle champagne, uh, was actually invented in Herefordshire uh, for bottling uh, sparkling perry and cider. And it should be called the Herefordshire method, not the champagne method. So there's a little factoid for you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, does anyone else have any questions? No, no. Let me just scan over. No, doesn't look like anyone's got any questions. Um, fab. Um, thank you so much, Tim. Um, that was really, really interesting. A nice perspective on orchards that that um, I don't think we would have got elsewhere. So thank you very much for your expertise and your um, your chat. Um, thank you very much, everyone, for coming to the talk. Um, and we'll see you at the next one.